Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Is that not just that worship? Come on, somebody, man. Give them guys. Come on, man. Amen. Amen. You know, I just, I love the Lord. I love it when he gets in the way and, and he does things and you're not expecting him to do things and he does it anyway. Praise God, right? Well, good morning. If you don't know who I am, my name's Mike Scan. Um, I got a little bit of feedback here. Uh, I'm the senior pastor here of ELC. I want to welcome you. Uh, and as Pastor Dustin said, we are, I know if, if you're not, if you've not been coming to ELC, you'll be like, okay, what's the big deal? It's a big deal. I mean, we went through Peter and it, you know, it only took 30 something weeks, you know, to get through it. Like it wasn't too bad. Uh, but yeah, you know, and so we were able to wrap that up a couple of weeks ago. And then I had the honor and privilege to go visit one of our partner communities um, out there in, uh, in La La Land out there. So it's really cool. God is doing something so cool. And I just want to mention this because, man, it's just like sometimes, you know, you kind of get this tunnel vision, right? Like especially churches, we kind of get this tunnel vision. And um, our heart, man, is to see the big C, you know, the big C do stuff, you know, the big church. And, and uh, getting to be a part of some of the communities that we are involved with really, man, is a testimony to that. Yahweh is doing something very tremendous in whatever, whatever you want to call this, whether you want to call it the Torah movement, uh, the way, uh, whatever you want to call it, Yahweh is doing something very, very special. And I really believe it's a revival. I believe it's a revival that springs out of a lot of prayer. I believe it's a revival sprung out of a lot of hunger and people are, they're wanting truth, right? Like today, I think one of the things that really just blessed me is that we had no background, we had no of the electric guitars and all that stuff, man, and, and God shows up, you know, it's like, now, I, I, there's nothing wrong with that stuff, I don't think there's things wrong with that necessarily, but man, it's amazing when just, you just sit back for a moment and just like, you know, maybe, just maybe, like God might know more than we do, like, right, just let's let him do stuff, right, amen, he is such a wonderful father. So this morning, I am, we are kicking off a new message. Obviously, it's called Prayer and Fasting. And uh, I want to jump right into this because there is a lot of stuff for me to cover this morning. Um, if, if there was, you know, we were talking about this in our men's ministry. If there was ever a time for a call to action in the body of Christ, it is right now. Um, I mean, we see like just recently, just kind of going over some, uh, you know, just some some current events, right? I mean, I don't have to, like, most of you in here know these events, but you look at things like what happened at the Olympics. Absolutely um, just, yeah, it's just, it's garbage. Um, what we're seeing happen in the Supreme Court, many of you all don't know that what's going on in the Supreme Court. Like, they're literally, because of, uh, because of this trying to protect the freedoms of our country, they're actually kind of redo the entire Supreme Court. Change so that the uh, conservative party or whatever, and I'm not, I'm not trying to preach party, but more of the, the, the perspective of, you know, good and evil. And evil is trying to win. And um, it's something that we've got to reconcile with. I think sometimes in the body of Christ, you know, we can... We can uh, we can get comfortable in what I call our four and no more, right? Some of y'all are familiar with that phrase. Some of you may not be. It's you got your little group of people, right? We're like, we want to protect our little group of people. And so we don't want to bring in anyone else. And so we just kind of, we protect our little, our little thing, our little clique, our little whatever. And I believe Yahweh is, is screaming at us right now. And by looking at the darkness of the world, it is easy for us to sit back, right? And look at darkness and call darkness, darkness. That's easy to do. You know what's really hard? is to do something about it. That's the hard part as followers of Christ, right? That the hard part is doing something about it. What do we do about it? Spiritual darkness is covering the world with an all-out war for anything that is good. And I mean anything. Isn't this what Scripture teaches, though? In the end times, men will call good evil and evil good. Are we not seeing that? I think we are. It was Edmund Burke who uh, coined the, the, the quote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is that good men do nothing. And you know what I feel like? I'm just going to, I'm speaking to myself. Please understand what I'm telling you is, you know, I get this first and I get the conviction first. 
And I believe that there are good people, there are people within the body of Mashiach, and they're not doing nothing but pointing out darkness. I know darkness is there. And so it's going to take us into, for the next uh, short weeks, it won't be near as long as our Peter series, but we're going to deal with prayer. And we're going to go into a place of prayer, man. And I pray, my, my heart prayer is that when we finish this series, that you will have a burden, not just a passion, but a burden to pray. A burden to say, man, we're not praying enough. We need to pray more. In a uh, commentary that I have on systematic theology by Hodge C., uh, written in 1997, this is, look at, this is what it says. It's, this is powerful. What is prayer? Let's look at it for a moment. Prayer is the converse of the soul with God. Therein we manifest or express to Him our reverence and love for His divine perfection, our gratitude for all His mercies, our penance of our sins, our hope in His forgiving love, our submission to His authority, our confidence in His care, our desire for His favor. And for the providential and spiritual, catch this, blessing needed for ourselves and others. What a great, very deep understanding of what prayer is. It is basically, to surmise all of that, it is basically us coming to Yahweh in whatever is burdening our heart, whatever is weighing on us, to go before Him and cast that care Upon him, understanding the rest of the passage, right? For he cares for us. I think that the authority that has been given to the body of Mashiach, man, is given to us through the power of prayer. It's time for the body to really understand and enter into a place of prayer. You know, there are, as a pastor, and you've been Christians for a while, I'm sure, there are certain disciplines in the body of Messiah that are, being, that are easy to kind of like negate. They're easy disciplines that we forego for other things. And it's not that necessarily we're in sin or something bad's happening, but they're things that are easily, easily thrown to the roadside, easily given up for the sake of other things. Prayer is one of them. Fasting is another. They're probably two, in my opinion, they are two of the most needed and the most abandoned in the faith. It's prayer and fasting. I talk to people all the time. I do a lot of counseling. And even in counseling, I'll ask questions like, did you pray about it? Well, well, well yeah, sort of. No, no, did you pray about it? Did you go into the throne room? Did you talk to the Father? And even a bigger question is, did you hear him? Isn't it amazing that within the body of Christ, I see this firsthand because men and women are giving in to the voice of themselves, the flesh, and not the voice of the, of the Lord. And so they'll make decisions on things that they shouldn't be doing, such as making vows that they shouldn't be making, making covenants that they should not be making. Because we, we well, I prayed about it. Did you? But did you really pray about it? Leonard Ravenhill says that prayer is the Cinderella of the church today. And, and look at what he says. He says, the Cinderella of the church today is the prayer meeting. This handmaid of the Lord is unloved and unwooed because she is not dripping with the pearls of intellectualism nor glamorous with the silks of philosophy. Neither is she enchanting with the tiara of psychology. She wears the humspun, humspun, of sincerity and humility, and so is not afraid to kneel. Prayer is not as sparkly. Not a lot of shine in it, right? Not a lot of wow. You know, like, like in, in the Torah community, one of the things I did you know, is, is that's interesting to me is that we love the new revelation, right? We just, we like, like oh my, did you hear what so-and-so said? And, wow, wasn't that great? But see, the thing about prayer, if you're doing it, if we're doing it, not a lot of glamour in it. Matter of fact, if we're doing it correctly on our own, no one will ever know. You'll get to see the results of prayer, but you won't see the actual thing happening in most instances. This is great description. Epic life here, I want to give you some. So we came, especially those who call this place their home, epic life came to be through prayer. And I mean, when we're talking about what, what, what epic life is, I want you to look around. 
This happened through men and women making sacrifices at 5 o'clock in the morning every Friday morning for I don't remember how long we did it for. And they would come in at 5 and we'd pray for one hour. And we would pray begging Yahweh to do whatever it is that He wanted to do. That we would not be satisfied with status quo. We wouldn't be satisfied with the glimpse and glimmer. We wanted His will. We begged Him to take away the things that did not please Him. There was about four or five of us that did it. Every morning. So when I look around, I see the results today of men and women who've made sacrifices. Sometimes it was sleep. Like, some of y'all know, 5 o'clock in the morning, which means to get here, because we prayed in the back, meant you got to get up around 4.30 or 4.45 to come and pray, to spend time. Everything that we do should be layered upon layer upon layer with the sacrifice of prayer. In the body of t- today, and, I, and when I say the body, please understand I'm talking about the entire body of Christ. Prayer is probably the most pathetic event sponsored by the church today. What do I mean by that when I say that? Mike, that's kind of harsh. I mean, and it's in attendance. It's desire in the hearts of people. Uh, Pastor Daniel has a saying that I absolutely love because he says, if you want to see how popular the preacher is, go to an evening, worship, or an evening service, like Sunday night or Saturday evening uh, worship night. But he said, if you want to see how popular God is, go to a prayer meeting. Because you'll see it. See, even, even for, the, for the pastor portion, you'll see the core people. The core people that are, like, they're the core people that help, like, lead the church. They're the people that are there, like, when you have those evening-type services, right? Outside of a Shabbat morning, right? But then when it comes to prayer, we're busy. We have too much on our plate. It's too far. Too long. Boring. Like, I don't get that. I've had a guy tell me, I don't understand that prayer thing, so I just, I just you know... Well, does anybody really understand prayer and how it works? It's absolutely amazing. Prayer takes time and, and it takes patience to see the rewards and its results. It doesn't happen overnight, right? I mean, it takes a lot of consistency in prayer. Reverend Hill goes on to say that the church right now has more fashion than passion, is more pathetic than prophetic, is more superficial than supernatural. And that's how we're seeing the church today, isn't it? Maybe this is why, listen to my heart this morning, our neighborhoods, our cities, our nation is in a spiritual place that's an end today and the darkness is just spreading because the desire to pray has left the church. Now please understand, I know this doesn't affect everybody. I know this isn't, like, you can't make a statement such as that I'm making that, like, this is everybody, but this is the norm. This is the norm. How do we know? Well, looking at a Barna survey, according to a 2021 Barna survey, the average Christian spends, watch this, one minute a day praying. And what's even more of a shame is while pastors spend what? Five minutes. A 2022 Baylor religion survey found that almost 40% of Americans pray for about one to two minutes and that uh, 44% pray for less than five minutes a day. We think that we've entered in kind of that place of prayer because we got in our car on our way to work that, oh Lord, I just give you this day and we take off and do whatever. At least it's something, I guess. The question then comes in is like, why is it so difficult for followers of Messiah? And stick with me on this because this is like, this is one of those things that I, I, I look and I go, why is it so tough? Why is it so difficult for Messiah followers to pray? And one of my all-time favorite passages was in the Tanakh, which is in the, the, the book of the prophets. And it's one of my favorite passages is Isaiah 56. And some of y'all probably know that by heart. You have it memorized. Because there's so many reasons, right? There's so many reasons why that is one of my favorite passages. Number one, it shows us and it tells us what? The reward of those, right? Those, uh, whether you're a eunuch or whether you're a foreigner, who make the, shop, the, the Sabbath day holy, who hold to Yahweh's Sabbath, and then the reward of that because of the foreigner. 
But what I want to address this morning is found in Isaiah 56, and it is very, that very thing. It's the reward. Like, what's the reward for us doing this? Well, let's look at the Scriptures. It says, also the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai to minister to him and to love the name of Adonai to be his servants. What? All these, oh, where it happened? Did I miss a page? Where would it go? Okay, all those and love the name of Adonai and be his servant. All who keep from profaning the Shabbat and hold fast to my covenant. Watch this. These I will bring to my holy mountain and let rejoice in my house of prayer. Now, this is critical. Like, this is critical when we understand. Like, we love, like, we love this part, right? We love, man, man, we're coming back to Shabbat. Like, I love this, who keep from profaning the Shabbat and hold fast to his covenant, right? And what's the reward? And let them rejoice in my house of prayer. These I will bring to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. Why? For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. What I love about this is that this is an invitation to us. That because of who we are and what we've made a decision to do to hold fast to the Shabbat, to hold fast to the covenant, what is the reward to come to the place of the, of, of the house of prayer? You know why this is so important? You know what this is really communicating, in my opinion? This is what it is. You have God's ear. You have his ear. He hears your prayers. Why? Because you honor him. Because you do what's commanded to us from the Torah. This is powerful. We have access, you and I, and anyone who joins themselves to Yahweh, who honor his Shabbat. Notice the reward. It's let them be in my house of prayer. Let them rejoice. Not just be in there, but let us rejoice. See, I think, man, that we need a radical change of heart in our, in our lives. A paradigm shift, if you will, in our thinking when it comes to prayer. Nothing. Here's, here's, did you know this? Did you know that Yahweh is not moved by circumstance? Did you know that? He's not moved by condition. If that was the case, if Yahweh, our God, our Holy Father, was moved by circumstances and condition, we wouldn't see the world in the condition that it's in. He's not moved by that. But you know what does move him? Our prayers. The way we pray, the way we obey, the way we honor him, the way we trust in him. Look throughout the characters within Scripture. Every person that Yahweh moved in is because that person trusted him had faith in him, believed that he would do what he said he would do. That's faith, brothers and sisters. That is amazing. And here's the beautiful thing about it is the same faith, the same ability, the same access that those brothers and sisters from Scripture we have as well because we honor him. This question that runs through my mind is this. If we understand and grab the significance of what Messiah has really done in our life, if we understand the sacrifice that was truly made, then why is it that Christians pray, don't pray like they should? And here's the reason. Now, you may want to pick up your feet just a little bit on this one. You ready? We don't value it. We don't value prayer. Now, it's not that we don't believe in prayer. That's not what this means. It's not saying that you, like, you hate prayer or you're anti. It's not that at all. It's just that the value for prayer is very low on the list of things to do that day. We have more important things to do. I got to get to work. I've got to get, I got to, you know, I've got to be at work at a certain time. I got to make that money, right? I, I've got, I've got more important things to do. I got to take care of the kids. All of those obviously very important, but the value of it is that it, we don't value it. It's very low on our, think about this for a moment, right? Think about this. Think about the very first thing that you do in the morning. I tell people that if you want to know where God's place is in your life, look at your calendar and look at your finances because they'll tell on you every time. They tell on you. They tell you what you really value, right? Where you spend all your time. What do you spend all your time doing? For some of the younger generation, they find themselves in front of a tube somewhere playing some video game. And then they wonder why God's not moving in their life. For others, it's to strive to be popular, to strive to do whatever, and they wonder why they're not hearing from Yahweh. Others, man, it's to try to keep up with the Joneses, trying to keep up in this world and trying to like do all this, and they can't do it. And they wonder why they can't hear from Yahweh. We just simply don't value it. A.W. Towser, who's a Christian author, 
said this. It says, the man, watch this is so good, the man who would what? Who would truly, why did I go backwards there? Who would truly know God, there it is, must what? Give time to him. Now, I'm not a, uh, certainly not an expert on marriage, um, but I've learned a couple of things in our 33 years of marriage. And one of them is, um, and, and I, I so much agree with what our brother said this morning, what Jordan said, right? Because a lot of times we're so passive sometimes as men, we don't, we don't communicate what needs to be communicated. But you know what I've learned in 33 years of marriage? You better talk to your spouse. You have to. Right? If you want to build relationship with a person, you know what you have to do? You have to talk to that person. You have to have communication. You know what the number one cause of divorce is in America, including the body of Christ now? We're not immune, immune to that. Communication. The couple stops talking to each other. They stop communicating with each other. They don't tell each other the problems that they're having or they're faced with, or one ignores the other one. This is how we build our relationship with Yahweh. We build our relationship with Yahweh through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer is the vehicle. Oops, sorry about that. Go back. Prayer is the vehicle that, this is so good, that will drive you into the Holy of Holies. We must understand the privilege that we have to come into His presence and into the presence of Yahweh. Even more than that is the cost. What did it cost for us to have this privilege? I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like when you pray, I, I haven't. I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes I don't think about the cost of that, that, that was paid so that I can come and speak to the Father. I mean, think about that cost for a moment. I, I, I was reminded as I was writing this message, and I was thinking about when I first came to Torah and kind of this aha moment, like everybody had their aha moment, right? My aha moment was reading the Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 17 or 15, whatever that is. And it's talking about, some of y'all know that, right? It's talking about breaking down the wall of hostility, right? The dividing wall of hostility, right? This is so, so good. Like, like, what is that wall? Like, some of you know it. I didn't. I had to, like, research it and figure out what this wall was. But it's the inner court wall. Like, when you look at the temple courts, there were two main walls. You had the outer court walls that just protected the entire temple altogether, Right? And Gentiles and females and Jews, everybody could walk in past that wall and get into that, that what's called the uh, uh, outer court. And then you had the next wall. And in the next wall was the inner court wall. This wall was called the wall of hostility. Why? Because it prevented anybody but a circumcised Jew in covenant with Yahweh to go into the inner court. No one else could go. So when Paul is referring us and telling us that this wall has been broken, do you realize, Gentile believers, that we've been given access to the very throne room of Yahweh, and we have a high priest. He is our new Kohen Gadol, Yeshua HaMashiach, that we now get to walk in past that. Matter of fact, they found in archaeological studies, I should have put it up here, they found a... a uh, like a sign, I guess an ancient sign, right? Because they had those, right? That said that basically, I'm paraphrasing, that by, by penalty of death, if you weren't circumcised and you entered in there, you'd be killed. I would say that's kind of a wall of hostility. Like, I'm like, wait a minute here. So even if you were a Gentile believer and you loved Yahweh and you followed Yahweh's commandments, you were not allowed to go into the inner court. Think about the cost that brings you and I now into that courtroom that we have the ear of Yahweh. Hallelujah. We have his ear. I mean, we could stop right there and go, let's just pray. Let's just pray right now. Because we. this is like, man, look at the cost. It just blows my mind, man. And how like we don't, we don't hold this thing in high, higher esteem than we do. Powerful. Look here at the book of Hebrews. Most of you all know this text, right? Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have boldness to enter. Did you get that? Boldness. How can you be so bold, Pastor Mike? Because the Bible says I can. Into the holies of holies by the blood of Yeshua. He inaugurated a new and living way for us through the curtain. See, I always understood the curtain, right? It being ripped, right? Well, ripped. Yeah, ripped down right? 
And the understanding of that we have this, we, we now have access, right? We have access to the Father. But then sometimes I've forgotten that, wait a minute, I gained that access because of the death of another. Right? I want you to feel the weight of that for a moment. Someone died. Our king died to re and this is why we say things in the name of Yeshua. Because by ourselves entering into the Holy of Holies uncleansed, right? You're talking about a death sentence. But because of what Jesus did for us, he goes before us into the Holy of Holies and now has washed us with that same blood that we are now able to enter in, not of our own accord, but because of who he is and what he did. Praise be to Yeshua. We also have a coin gadol over God's household. There you go. Wow. I love this. And the challenge is like, do I really, am I, am I, I want to challenge you today. Maybe, maybe you do pray, but I want to challenge you to pray more to enter into the Holy of Holies. Look, it goes on Hebrews 10. So what? Let us draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Why can we have full assurance of faith? Because of what Jesus did. With heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and a body washed with pure water. We get to enter in because of what Messiah has done for us. See, when we learn to pray, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You want to know what will happen? It will put counselors across the nation out of business. Psychologists. Uh oh, big pharma. Big pharma will go out of business when the body of Christ begins to take their position. So let's stop talking about big pharma. Let's start praying against it. Let's stop talking about the garbage that's going on in the White House and in our government, and let's start praying against it. Let's stop talking about abortion. Let's start praying against it and start doing something about it. What would happen if the body of Messiah rose up and said, Enough is enough? We're going to the Father. What would happen? But we don't. I didn't put the scripture in there, but the scripture says, it says, I looked for a man to stand in the gap and found none. Yahweh's searching for those of us who will stand in the gap. And you don't have a gift like, like I'm, I'm not called to, I'm not an intercessor. Yes, you are. You're a believer. You got people that are surrounding you that love you that maybe don't know Messiah. You're an intercessor. You should be interceding for them. You have a husband that's unsaved. You should be interceding for him. You have a wife unsaved. You should be interceding for her. Right? We have a nation that's crumbling. We should be praying. Understanding and learning this, man, this will open up. This is a key to peace. Like we have depression. It's just as rampant in the world. It's in the church. Depression. Identity crises. People have an identity crisis. And look, all, we have access to the Father, the very creator of us. We have access to him. And like, let's put these people out of business. Let's, let's, let's walk. We were praying this this morning. Let's, we pray like every time these doors open that people that are filled with bondage or strongholds or if they're lost and they have no relationship, we're praying for them. So when they come in here, they may know not why. Like you may have came in this morning and you were just burdened and you were heavy and then you came in and you're like, wait a minute, what's, what's going on? Because there's people praying for you. You're here this morning because someone prayed for you. I'm here this morning as a believer in Messiah because someone prayed for me. Had it not been for my wife and her prayers, man, I don't know where I would be. Who prayed for you? What grandmother or mother or father or friend or pastor prayed for you? Prayer is so powerful. Now, here's what I want to show you. Let's take a look. I want to go over to the book of Revelation. Because see, prayer, prayer, first of all, I want to talk about that. Like, prayer should be serious. Like, when you enter to a time of prayer, like, I tell people this, like, find a place in your, find a place in your home and make that your prayer place, right? And, like, don't do anything in that area, that little corner, that little whatever, and make that your place for prayer. And don't do anything. Else. Make that holy. Why? Because it's, a, it's an attitude. As we go into this place, we understand it's an attitude, right? That's why the house of prayer, that's why Jesus was so angry, 
They were selling and doing all this marketing stuff and cheating people out of, out of uh, sacrifices and charging them more than they should have. And Yeshua comes in and he flips the table and he said, what? My house will be a house of prayer. It should be holy. Kadosh, set apart, right? But watch this. This is so good, which many of you may know this and some of you may not. When we bow down and we pray with a sincere heart and we open up and we say, God, we want you to do. Listen, your prayers are never wasted. Do you know the Bible shows us that? It shows that your prayers are never, they never fall on deaf ears. Look at Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. Now, this is Yeshua opening the scrolls like that most of us know about the end times, right? And he says, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp, golden bowls full of incense, and what? Which are the prayers of the Kedoshim. See, the Kedoshim is the word that we get translated in English as the saints or the righteous or the set apart. It's you and I. But notice Notice what happens when the prayers, they're put into this, this, uh, this they're, they're put up in this bowl, bowl of full incense, which are the prayers of Kedoshim. Our prayers do not fall on deaf ears. Our prayers do not just sit in limbo. No, they mean something. When you pray and you pray in faith, trusting Yahweh, they go somewhere, they do something. Continuing on in verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden incense burner. He was given much incense to offer, what? Along with the prayers of all the Kedoshim. In other words, all the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. They're presented to Yahweh. How amazing is that? I know some people, man, you needed to hear that today because you've been praying for something and you don't think anything's happening. Let me tell you something, something's happening. See, we think and we do what we can do in the natural, in the physical. But there's something happening in the supernatural, in the spiritual, that we have no idea. That's why the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of this dark world, right? That's why the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical, flesh-type weapons, but they're spiritual. We pray physically with us, but man, it's all handled in the spirit, this is extraordinary that when you pray, it's not wasted. Now, I want to show you something. I want to go to David for a second and look at King David. Because David kind of had it, man. He, boy, he, he got it down, right? And we know David was a king. David wasn't perfect by any means, right? And so that's another thing that I love that, like, when we look at the characters within Scripture, how imperfect they were, and yet God said, you reached out to me, I'll reach out to you. I love that. Sometimes we forget, like, like, well, God can't do it. To, well, he did it to David, right? He did it with Abraham. Like, we love Abraham. Abraham is the father of our faith. But look at all the junk that Abraham did. I mean, come on now. Calling your wife your sister? Come on, brother. Sounds like Arkansas type stuff, man. Like, I'm sorry if you're from Arkansas. I apologize. You know. But listen to me. I mean, we, we hold all of these men in value, but look at their mistakes. Look at their failures. Yet when they came to Yahweh with a sincere heart, when they honored him, Yahweh moved. We see this in David. Look at what David says. David says, as for me, I will call on God and Adonai who will save me. I love this. Watch this. Every morning, evening, morning, and noon, I complain and I moan. Do you know something? Sometimes it's okay to do that. Matter of fact, I would submit to some of you, I'd rather you do it there than in the community sometimes. It's not that you don't get a brother or sister and you cast your care on them and say, hey, I'm really having a rough time. But you know something? You'll get better results when you do it here. Just as David did. What does he say? Evening, morning, and noon, I complain, I moan. Then what? He hears my voice. Yahweh knows your, have you ever thought about that? Here's another aha. Do you realize that Yahweh knows your voice specifically? I mean, the Bible says that he counts every head or every hair on our head, for those who still have it. Maybe it's just, I'm sorry, bro. Love you, man. Right? So if he can count every hair on my head, then surely he knows my voice. He knows when I pray to him. He hears me. He hears you. This was David. 
David wanted to spend time with Yahweh. He bathed himself in prayer. But also note, note, note and know this, this didn't carry this morning, noon, and night. This wasn't just something David did. Do you realize this is carried out over into the New Testament as well? Like we see that. Like I was talking to a brother yesterday. I'm like, it's one of the challenges that I've been challenged with for this year is to pray three times a day. And I'm not saying that for a pat on the back because I am absolutely failing at it, by the way. I do it. I'm trying. But it's something that I felt like Yahweh has challenged me for, to pray three times a day. Why? I don't know. Because like when Peter and John were on their way to the temple at one of the hours to pray, which is one of the third hours, they healed someone. Not that that happens to me. I don't come into my church like, hey, let me stop by and heal someone. But I just think it's awesome that it's, it's throughout the scriptures. He bathed himself in prayer. Matter of fact, we see this in even in the Jewish people, right? They pray three times a day. And see, here's something that will probably offend and get us marked off YouTube. The Muslims didn't come up with that. You're a little controversial. No, I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to give you truth. What a challenge for all of us to pray three times a day. And it doesn't have to be long. Maybe it's just a moment of just spending some time with Yahweh. Maybe because we just don't spend enough time with him. Imagine what would happen in your life, in your relationships. Imagine what Yahweh could do to a man who submits himself three times a day to pray and speak, spend time with him. What kind of father he would be. What kind of husband he would become. What kind of leader he would become. What kind of uh, employee he would become at work. Can you imagine that for a moment, how your life could drastically change? I do a lot of counseling, and if couples would just grab a hold of this. I had someone approach us um, not too long ago talking about Robbie and I's marriage and our relationship. And, she's, and they said, you know, you really need to do a message on marriage. And I've done messages on marriage before. But as I was thinking through this and, and, create, and writing this message, I thought, man, this is the key. This is the key to everything. How do I become a better husband? I go to prayer and I talk to my father and he tells me how to be a better husband. How do you become a better wife? You, you, you get rid of everything and you go in prayer and you say, Lord, how do I become a better wife? How do I become better in my finances? I don't know. Read the book of Proverbs and go to Yahweh and ask him. And not, this is the hard part, because when we pray, we have to get away from our emotions and kind of set those things aside, because you'll be moved by what you feel, right? You'll be moved by emotion instead of being moved by faith, and moving what Yahweh commands in his Torah. Maybe that's your problem today. Maybe you have a problem with Torah, right? Well, can I ask you and challenge you, have you taken it to prayer? Have you fasted over it? Have you, like, wrenched on the carpet? Do you have calluses on your elbow and on your knee from pleading to Yahweh, Lord, show me your truth? Because if you haven't, I submit to you today that you will have a hard time understanding truth. Maybe this is how the church, and I say that with the big C, got in the condition that it's in because they allowed people to come up to the podium and speak things and never took it to prayer. And never took it to say, wait a minute, that's not matching up. Yahweh, what do you want me to do with this? It's time that we come back to pray. It is our communication. You know, prayer is battle, man. It's all about the, it's warfare. I said this before, and some of you in the room and are online today, you kind of understand this because you were in the military, right? And the very first thing you want to do with your enemy is disrupt the communication lines. You don't want them getting the orders and, and, and know what to do or, or find out where the enemy is, right? So you disconnect, you discontinue, or you, you destroy the communication lines. Isn't it interesting that that's one of the things that you do? The other thing is to take their supply line. And here's the thing, Christian, all of that comes from us in prayer. Our supply line and our communication. You're discombobulated in your relationship with Yahweh. You're discombobulated in your family. You're discombobulated in many areas of your life. You have worries and stress that you have not taken it to Yahweh and casted that thing down. Or if you did cast it, you've got a reel hooked up to your pole, right? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And you're reeling it back in. 
He doesn't tell us to do that. He says, give it to him. Lay it at his feet and then stop worrying. You know what worry is? Uh, this may come out in another message. Worry is a lack of faith. When we worry, we're simply not trusting in the creator. We're not trusting in what his Torah says. We're not trusting in what his spirit is leading us to do. And so we worry and we try to manage it ourselves and we can't understand why it's not working out because you don't trust him. You don't trust him. What keeps you? What's keeping you from entering into the Holy of Holy? What keeps you from trusting him? The best stories of all, man, I think when it comes to prayer is Daniel, right? Like Daniel, like think about this. Daniel had favor. He had favor with King Nebuchadnezzar. But all the people around them didn't like that. They wanted that same favor. They wanted that, right? Do you know something? This is a side note. That when you spend time with Yahweh, you know what you're going to gain? You're going to gain favor. Right? Doesn't it say that when we humble ourselves privately, right? And there's no greater humility, man, than humbling yourself in prayer. And he will do what? He'll exalt you openly. But Daniel had this beautiful relationship not only with the Father, and he stayed true to that relationship. Because of that relationship with his father, he also had this, this, this favor with Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar's other guys that didn't have that favor that Daniel had came to Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, you know, we should make a law. We should make a rule. We're starting to see that in our own culture. That any time the bell rings or the sound is made or the trumpet sound, that everybody has to fall down and worship you. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, this is for you, Nebuchadnezzar. We just want to honor you. Isn't that the devil, man? And they didn't. So he's like, oh, this is a great idea. What a great idea. I mean, who, what man in the flesh wouldn't go, hey, great idea. Yeah, come worship me. So what happens? Daniel hears about it. And when Daniel learned that a written decree had been issued, I love this, he went into his house. I just, like, I'm walking this out in my brain. Like, I just see Daniel doing this stuff. Like, right? He, went to, he goes into his house where the windows in his upper room open towards Jerusalem three times a day. Wait a minute, Daniel did it. He had favor with Yahweh. There's a whole other three times a day. I may, we just made a preach a message called three times a day. Right? He kneels down, and what does he do? He prayed and gave thanks before Yahweh. And I love this. Don't miss this. Just as he did before. Nothing stopped him. He did what it was normal for him to do. See, we know this because somehow these yahoos had to understand that they were walking. They were nosy bodies, right? There are a lot of nosy bodies in the body of Christ some days, right? They're worried about everything but themselves. And that's what these guys were doing. They'd look up and they'd see old, old Daniel up there praying three times a day. That's when the law came about. But did it change Daniel? No, it didn't change Daniel. So my question to you is, what's changing you and causing you not to go into a place of prayer? It certainly ain't death. Because Daniel knew by him doing this, he was writing a death sentence to himself. we got to understand that's powerful. Then these men came as a group and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So they approached the king and spoke to him about the royal decree. Didn't you issue a written? Isn't this funny, right? <laughs> like, like, oh yeah, well I did it only because you made the idea, right? Didn't you issue a written decree? I love how they put the death of someone else on the king. That anyone who prays to any god or man for 30 days except for you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king replied, the decree stands according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. See, once they created a law, there was a law in their law that says once the law was created, they couldn't change it. And that's what happened. We should not be repealed. It's a great story. Go study it. So the question then is, what do I use or what do we use as an excuse not to pray? Daniel, knowing that he would be caught in the decree of law that prohibited him from worshiping and play, uh, praying to any other God, and knowing he could face death, continued to do what he did, praying three times a day, which was his custom, which is what he did before. He never changed. I said this earlier, that prayer is not just a one-way conversation. I want you to understand that. Maybe that's the issue. Maybe sometimes we're doing all the talking. That's hard. Sometimes we talk too much. I know I do. Especially if I've had two minutes of coffee. Right? Thank you. Praise God. My elder. Keep me humble. 
But sometimes we talk, even in prayer, we do all the talking. Now, one of the avenues or one of the things I think that is missing in our prayer time is the, is the, is the, the gift of meditation. Now, before you freak out and run out there, I'm not talking about yoga and some demonic garbage, paganism. But I'm talking about meditating on his word. See, to meditate on something, it literally is a way of us regurgitating Yahweh's word in us so that we get everything out of it, the, the richness of his word. I remember not too long ago, I was in a very difficult place. I was coming off sabbatical, and um, there was an event that happened, and uh, I was still out there. I was out there camping, and I began to pray. And we'd been praying the whole time, and, I, and, and something happened. And I called my elders, and, and they prayed with me. But the thing that changed me, the thing that changed, got me out of this, almost this crazy stupor that I was falling into, was that one of, the, one of our elders sent me a passage of Scripture. And everything that, that, that happened, the elders, like, they were super encouraging as I was kept wrapping up this, this sabbatical. I just had a burden. I had a weight. And everything they said was, man, it, it was encouraging. It really was. But it was, this me- it was this word, a scripture verse that was sent to me, and I began to meditate on it. And you know what happened? The more I meditated on it, the more I chewed on it, the more real it became in my life. The more I began to lean in more and more and more to Yahweh during this moment in my life. And matter of fact, it was after that that I did that, that my whole sabbatical completely changed. It like instantly there was refreshment in my, in my spirit. Instantly I knew there was clarity. I knew what I needed to do. I knew what we were supposed to do as a community. It was just instantaneous. That's the power of meditation. Meditating on good things, Yahweh's word. Meditating on who Yahweh is. Maybe just meditating on what Yeshua has done for you that brings you into the faith. That's pretty powerful. See, there's so much that we can get when we tune in to the Spirit of the Lord by meditating on His Word. I want to look back again at David and look at what he says. He says that my soul is satisfied as with fat and oil, so my mouth praises you with joyful lips. Watch this, verse 7. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you through the night watches. Here's something. Have you ever been woken up by the Lord? See, when you wake up, like some people, like they wake up in the middle of the night, man, I didn't get no sleep, I just couldn't sleep, but wait a minute. You realize that may be Yahweh speaking to you, stirring you up, going, hey, get up. You know what's crazy? For a season, it hasn't happened lately, but for a season, I would say probably a year. I think you know what I'm about to say, right? For about a year, almost every time Yahweh would wake me up, it was at 3.33. Like every time. And so the first couple of times it happened, I'm like, 3.33, that is weird, right? And then someone mentioned to me, you, you might want to open up the book of Jeremiah. Uh, that's right? Well, I'm not as sharp as some people, okay? It takes me a second, <laughs> all right? I opened up to Jeremiah 3.33 and it says, call unto me and I'll show you great and mighty things in which you do not know. This happened for over a year. That I would wake up, I'd look at the clock, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Or I'd be prepping in my message even, and I'd walk out of my office, and I'd walk down. Usually, I like to pace down up and down the hallway when I'm, when I'm, I'm prepping. And I'd look in on the kids' uh, room, and there's a, 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 a red clock in there that you can see, and it would say 333. It's absolutely insane. Well, what is it? It's Yahweh. Again, I'm a little thick-headed. Come and pray. Come away with me. I've heard story after story of people who've heard that same thing, that Yahweh calls them away. Hey, come away with me. Come, come spend time with me. Do you remember, and I don't know if it was for you, if it was for me, like when you first gave your life to Messiah, or maybe when you first came to the knowledge and understanding of Torah, how much time did you spend in prayer then? I mean, for me, it was like I I was wrapped up in it because I wanted to make sure that what was happening and what I was doing was correct. I got more revelation, more understanding in those moments, those quiet moments by myself than two or three hours spent on YouTube. 
It's powerful. I cannot begin to tell you the amount of times that we have been steered awake by the Holy Spirit because he wants us to come away and spend time meditating on his word and speaking to him. Many times in the weeks and hours of the morning or even late at night, the night watches. This is where we find Messiah. Isn't it interesting? That's what Messiah did. I mean, we look at Mark. Sorry, I didn't bring that back. Mark 135. Very early, while it was still night, Yeshua got up and left and went away to a place in the wilderness. And there he was praying. Matter of fact, when you study the the life of Messiah, you see this happening over and over again. He would minister during the day, but in the night watches, you'd find him in prayer to the Father. And we all in this room have no debate that we want to live a life like Messiah. He prayed a lot. Yeshua had that pattern. Praying during the night watch is one of the most powerful places you can pray and spend time hearing from Yahweh. You know why? You know what I believe? It's because it's where the fewest distractions are. It's where everything's turned off. Your kids are asleep in bed, hopefully. Right? It's, it's those moments where everything just settles down. And one of the things that I like to do when this happens is I love to go outside and when, I, when I'm stirred, I'll walk outside, and the very first thing that Yahweh always has me do, it's just the thing that I have, is I look up and I see all of the stars in the heaven. And it's always impressed upon my heart how he put every one of those in place. And if he can hold every one of those in place in its position, surely he can deal with my little problem. Isn't that amazing? And sometimes we forget who our God is because of the distractions. But biblically, we see it all over the place. We go over to Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19. It says, arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the life of your children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. Literally, this is a plea to intercede of the things that are going on. Some of you guys are carrying all of this weight on your shoulders. And I truly believe that today, Yahweh is telling you, cry out to him. Now coming full circle, right? We come full circle. Again, going back to what David said. Psalms 119, 148. He says, my eyes are up before every night watch. As I what? Meditate on your word. See, communication and prayer is not just a one-way street. It's really two things. Like we pray and we need to learn to hear and learn to listen. I didn't put this text up there. I probably will bring it back around uh, through the series. But it was Yeshua who said that my sheep hear my voice. And what? A stranger's voice they'll not follow. May I submit to you today that maybe your voice can be a stranger's voice? that you're listening to your voice and sometimes, and especially when it goes against Scripture. Somebody has asked me one time, and this is not the message today, but it's just something to think about. They'll ask, how do I know? How do I know that it's Yahweh that's speaking to me? Now, I'm sure you could add to this list, but I have just a couple of, just a couple of criteria that I look at when I'm looking at Scripture and I'm praying and I'm asking God to do something. Number one, Yahweh never, never rushes me. He never does. He's very methodic. He's very slow. He's very, like, leads me. He never pushes me. It's always easy. It always brings, the second thing, it always brings his peace. Even if it's a chaotic thing to do. Now, notice, it's not relief. There's a difference in relief versus shalom. See, relief is like, like if you were asked by Pastor Mike to come up here and preach and you've never done it before and uh, maybe you know that you're supposed to do it but you don't want to do it because it's like I got to stand in front of all these people and I got to, what if I mess up? What if I sing a song and I sing the wrong lyric, right? What if I play the wrong note? What, I mean, what have I got to do here? And then you make a decision to go, you know what? I just feel like God say no, not my turn, right? Like, and you feel that all go away, right? That's relief, Shalom is when Yahweh's asking you to do something, and despite all of that turmoil that's going on inside you, you step up to the plate and you do what Yahweh tells you to do. 
And people go, man, you did that so easy. Like I was tore up on the inside. Shalom. The other thing, and probably one of the most important things, Yahweh never speaks against this Torah. It will always align to his word. Always. Let me give you an example of that. Now, I'm not against getting car loans if you can afford it. I know sometimes that's just, it's the way it is sometimes in our culture to get, if you have to get a new vehicle or a new used vehicle. But I had an individual that I was counseling, and they were in, they were kind of in dire straits and financially. And so they had come to me one day, and they said, Pastor Mike, we really feel like we need to pray about getting a new car. And I said, well, I, I'll, I'll pray with you on that. I can agree that Yahweh will bring a, a, a cash car. That's what I'm thinking in my brain, right, like a cash car, because they could not afford it. And so now these people had, they were decently financially. They had some, but they just had a lot of debt. And, um, and so they came to me and said, hey, what do you think? I said, well, you know, the Bible says that the borrower is slave to the lender. You know, let's, like, like, let's put some money aside and, and, and pay some cash if you can at this moment. And so I think one of them had decent credit. The other one had bad credit. And so they ended up going to a car dealership, and they ended up buying a car that was probably like forty or $50,000. And they said they knew it was God because they got the car. I'm like, man, a monkey can go get a car nowadays, brother. Like, just because you, the creditors, like, they, they want you. They'll make a way. Like, what's your interest rate? Oh, it's, it's not too bad. It's only about 13%. And people think that's God because, it, because the door opened for them to get this. Well, get, can I tell you a little secret? You know, the devil can do things like that. Our enemy, Hasatan, can make things like that happen. You know, Hasatan, he, he, when you pray things, right, and he comes out, he hears it too. And he can make things happen in your life that aren't biblical. He can bring people in your life that will give you advice that contradicts Yahweh's word. This is why it's so imperative that as followers of Messiah, we know what it says. So that when you are prayer in prayer and you're praying about some certain aspect and you hear that voice come to you that says, oh, that's a great idea. And God's screaming at you, no, it's not. We have to learn to hear. And that takes practice. It takes practice learning to hear Yahweh's voice. Sometimes it's that, that, that impression that you get in your spirit. That you just know you should do something. Like there's a, an instant that I heard about this as a praise report uh, when the 9-11 towers fell. When 9-11 the towers fell. Is that a gentleman who was a follower of Christ, he was getting up, getting ready, but he said that he said something just weighed on his spirit for him not to go into work that day. And he'll tell you, he said, I can't explain it. But he didn't go. Many did, and we know the result of that. See, here in this passage of 119, we now have the both, both why, like we hear, we have both. We have why he's up before the night watches, he's praying. That's the implication, but also notice that he's meditating on the word. He may say, well, what do you do when, when, when you're not hearing? You wait. What do you do when I don't have an answer? You wait. What do you do when you've, I've gathered my elders and I've gone to them and, and I'm getting like great, like they're saying everything I want to hear, but something in me like, you wait. We have to start praying again. There is a war going on and far too many believers are sitting on the sidelines of this battle. We see darkness is spreading in homes and schools and yes, the church. And our response in many places, I'm not saying everywhere, but in many places, it's silence. And I know that many within the Torah community, I want you to hear my heart this morning. I know many in the Torah community don't like public school. Amen and amen. But you should be praying for them. Because there are still families that can't afford to send their children to homeschool or homeschool and stay home. They're not in a position to be able to do that. So we should be praying protection over them. We should be calling out darkness and piercing it with the word of Yahweh. Notice, I love something, one of my favorite passages here, another favorite, is in the book of Acts. Because it's something that I think we forget. We love the, like I said, it's, as Christians, as followers, we love the big shiny stuff. 
Like, like we love it when we quote Acts. Oh, you know, they gathered in people's homes in the book of Acts. Ah, that was awesome. We should do the same. Come on, let's meet in our home. Let's read what the Bible says. It says they were devoting themselves to the teaching of the emissaries and to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. Some theologians believe that we're, they're referencing here, it says two prayers, they're referencing the three times a day they were gathering to pray. So they didn't just gather in homes to fellowship and to eat. They gathered to pray as well. Fear lay upon every soul and many wonders and signs were happening through the apostles. How powerful is that? What did they do? They devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Not at this or that, not, a, not against each other, but both have the value and need it in the kingdom. Jump me back over to David. Psalms 109, beginning in verse 2, it says, For the wicked and the deceitful have opened their mouth against me. Are we not seeing the wicked are so prideful out there, there is no shame in what they are doing? None. Why? Because Christians lay silent. They spoke to me with a lying tongue, with hateful words surrounded me and fought against me without cause. Verse 4. In return for my love, they are my accusers. But I'm in prayer. See, let me tell you something. You are going to face attack. You are going to have, uh, man, battles. No matter how big that battle gets, you stick to prayer. Where do you turn when the enemy pokes his head up? What do you do when the pressures of life begin to press against you to point you to, to the point where you cannot breathe? Do you gather with people and you complain and you have a pity party with them? Do you do a lot of wishing? Or do you pray? Notice here that when they fought against me without cause, but what? I'm in prayer. I'm in prayer. I was thinking about, I'm a big history buff, if you didn't know that. I love the history of our nation. I love this nation. I love what it started out when it started out right. And probably one of the most difficult people, I would say, the most, one of the guys that probably had one of our leaders that had one of the most difficult transitions of his presidency is Abraham Lincoln. Look at what he says about prayer. He says, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient. For the day. See, when we come to the place of understanding, this is a place of humility, isn't it? To realize that it doesn't matter what I do, what I say, I need his wisdom. I need his discernment in my heart and in my life. If anything's going to change, it is not going to be by my human hands, but it's going to have to be by supernatural hands. And what he was fighting was a demonic battle. Paul echoes the same conviction when he says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. He says what? He says, rejoice always. Pray constantly. In everything, give thanks for what? This is Yahweh's will for you in Messiah Yeshua. What is, you, wanna, you ever come to me and go, I really want to know God's will for my life. Well, there you go, bro. There you go. I am done. Drop the mic. We're out of here, right? Rejoice always. Some of y'all need that one this morning. Pray in everything, give thanks. In everything, yep, in everything. When everything is going bad, when everything doesn't make sense, when you don't know what you need to do, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Messiah. And Yeshua, I love this story about Yeshua, right? And I'm not going to go into the story, but just, you know, maybe paraphrase it here. But look at Yeshua. He says, Luke 18, 1, Yeshua told them a parable, What? To show them that they should always pray and not be discouraged. Not be discouraged. Like, think about that for a moment. 
Are you discouraged? Our king said that we should always pray. And then this is where he goes into that story of the widow, right? Who's, who's persistent against the judge and wants the judge to do a rendering for her on her behalf. And he basically throws up his hands and says, man, if I don't, if I don't bless her and answer her, she's going to continue to just be on my door. Judge, judge, judge. You know, you realize what Yeshua is saying? Why aren't we doing that? Isn't that awesome? He gives us a demonstration and shares us with the parable of how to do it. Some of you men are like, you pray one time and you give up. He said, man, keep asking. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. And the door shall be open to you. Are you wrestling with discouragement? Are you wrestling with decisions that you do not know what you're to do? Indecisiveness? There is wisdom. There is wisdom in, in talking to people. You know, scripture tells us that in the Proverbs, right? The multitude of counselors that are safety. But we shouldn't grow to a dependency upon man. We should learn to pray and learn to hear the voice of Yahweh and never forget to pray and not forget to meditate on his word. Don't forget to go to the one who is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. And I say this all the time, man, that I love what I love about just the omnipotency of the Lord is he's already been there. He knows the east from the west. He knows everything about you, right? This is really part of the vision of epic life that we use. We, we, we quote Psalms 139 verse 16 a lot because I truly believe this, man, that it says that before a, anything was done in our life, it was written down in, the, in his book. Well, he's got to be a lot smarter than me. And so I want to know what's written in that book. Would you show me what I'm supposed to do? Would you tell me what I need to do? Would you guide me? I want us to see today the power of prayer. I also want us to see it at the power of a community level. Because the community level, when we gather together in prayer, is powerful. And when two are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. And it says that when two agree as touching anything, it says it is established by our Heavenly Father. Obviously, that anything, it should be in line with Yahweh's word. That's another message. I mean, look at the prayer of Peter in Acts 4, 29 through 31. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant your servants to speak your word with utmost courage while you stretch out your hand. They did not like the gospel being preached. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Yeshua. Notice who's being glorified. Notice it's not about the situation. It's about, the, it's about a Savior, right? It's about Jesus. What happened? When they, what? Prayed. The place where they gathered was shaken. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of Yahweh with boldness. This is the power of unified prayer. And every person in this room is a conduit to that. Prayer is absolutely a game changer in the life of a believer. They spoke the word of God with both. This almost sounds like Acts 1, doesn't it? That's the power of prayer. We need this boldness today. When men and women are broken before Yahweh and are pleading to him to move, this becomes the result. I've said this so many times. Every revival in this nation began with men and women whose hearts were to see God move. Lives changed. And hearts transformed. They came together and they pleaded with Yahweh, much like we did here at ELC. We pleaded with him. We wanted him and his glory to show up. If you want to see these things happen, look at John Wesley and his revivals. Amazing historical um, research you can do on that one. But here's one of the ones that really caught my attention. It's the Businessmen's Revival of 1857. Most of you in this room probably have never even heard of this. 
It was a revival that lasted over a year. It began in 1857 and, and ended in 1858. And this revival began with a, launch, a lunch hour prayer meeting by a single man in New York City in 1857, led by lay missionary Jeremiah Calvin Lanfear. The meeting became well publicized and popular. I'm giving you just a super brief. The first day he had it, the first day he had it, he had six people show up. And he was okay with it. Like, hey, hey, that's six that I didn't have. I want you to picture that for a moment. He would go around to the local businesses and tell them, hey, what was happening here during this time frame is that businessmen, this is during the, uh, uh, what is it, the great, uh, man, we were prospering and everything like that, and men were leaving their responsibilities of spiritual taking care of their family because they were working. They weren't home. They weren't good, being good father figures. They weren't being good husbands and leading their family. So Lanfear's heart and passion was to bring these men to a place of prayer. So he'd go around to these businesses and say, hey, we're going to meet at this place. It was an old rundown church that was right downtown in New York. And what happened? Six people the first day. The meetings became well publicized and popular. And by the following year, 10,000 men and women, or I'm sorry, 10,000 men were praying daily. The revival spread across the country. Grab that for a moment. And it's estimated to have added one million believers to the body of Messiah. Started by one man that had a passion for men who were in business. To have them step back into the role that they were called to. This is one of many stories that are out there of revivals that began when people's heart yearned to see Yahweh move. It was these um, revivals such as this that closed down brothels in San Francisco and the Azusa Street Revival. Closed down bars. Closed down other things. And lasted for so long. One of the longest lasting revivals was the Azusa Street Revival. And it started with about three men who came together to pray for their city. Yahweh responds. In Acts chapter 9, this is powerful. So Peter got up. He went with them. When he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The widows were crying, showing all the tunics other and other clothing Dorcas had made while she was with them. Right? This is all the story of a, of a very righteous woman of Yahweh. And they heard that Peter was in the area and she had died. But they knew Peter. And they knew that Peter prayed. And Peter walks in. But Peter sent them outside because they're all weeping, doing their thing. And he got up. He got down on his knees. And he prayed. Then turning to the body, he said to Tabitha, Get up. She opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. The power of prayer. This is the power of prayer demonstrated through the pages of Torah. We see God's intervention into man because someone stood in the gap and prayed. We see healings. We see provision. We see deliverance. Time and time and time again, we see Yahweh do what Yahweh does. We have the same access to these, that these men did because of the blood of Yeshua. We can enter with boldness the throne of grace that we may receive mercy in a time of need. I want to close with this passage found in the book of James. A passage, and then I've got one other thing. In the book of James, this is what it says. Or it says, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of Matthias community. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And what? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. This is the power for, can you see it now? I want you to grab a hold of this. Why the enemy, this is why the enemy will keep us from prayer. This is why, if you, some of you know what I'm talking about. You get ready to go pray, and the dog starts barking uncontrollably. You don't know why. And there's nothing out there. It's just the dog doing dog stuff, right? 
Or something falls off the counter and you got to stop and clean it up. You got, your husband comes home, your wife comes home, something happens. Something disturbs that moment. I told somebody this once before, I don't know if they believe me yet, but every time we enter into a, prayer, a place of prayer, if you'll watch and if you'll listen, people will start coughing uncontrollably. Certain people. Some of y'all have seen that before. It's absolutely weird. Or they'll yawn. Yeah, they yawn, right? They'll, all of a sudden there's yawning going on and coffee. What is that? Because prayer is a spiritual weapon. It's a spiritual weapon. Push through that garbage. Push through that stuff and stay in a point of prayer. See, we know the enemy doesn't want us healed. He doesn't want to people set free from bondages or stronghold. He doesn't want a church filled with people who know that what happens when they come in in the name of Yeshua. He doesn't want people to know what they're supposed to do when he begins to lie and deceive or when they call upon the name of Yahweh. I'm going to have the worship team come up, closing with this. Some of you all are familiar with a guy named Dr. William James Mayo. Now, he owns the Mayo Clinic, or he's not the, oh, he's the founder of Mayo Clinic, and it is all over the place. I think there's about four different places and also on another continent, um, I believe. But he was a doctor who founded this uh, amazing, smart, intelligent man. Now, you, this is coming from a doctor. Look at what he says. He says, I have seen patients that were dead by all standards. We know they could not live. But I've seen a minister come into the bedside and do something for him that I could not do. Although I have done everything in my professional power. But something touched some immortal spark in him. And in defiance of medical knowledge and materialistic common sense... That patient lived. Church, never underestimate the power of prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer. No matter what you're going through, what's going on, man, Yahweh is faithful. And here's what I love, man, about this, is that Yahweh is no respecter of person. He does for one, he'll do for another. We just have to trust him. We need to make prayer a priority in our hearts, in our lives. Daddies, here's what I want you to do. You need to make prayer a priority in your home if you've not done it. If anything, at least on the Eve Shabbat, that you gather your family and you pray. Pray for your family. Pray for the lost ones that are in your family that are connected to you. Pray for this ministry. Pray for the elders. Pray for your city. Pray for those broken people who get up there in the Olympics and thought that they were doing something good. Pray that they would come to know Messiah. Pray that their hearts would be broken. Pray that conviction of sin and lawlessness would, it would just spread across this nation. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray and begin in our homes. Speaking of which, we're going to take some time to pray.